Let us pray. O God, you declare your almighty power most chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Mercifully grant to us such a measure of your grace that we, running the way of your commandments, may receive your gracious promises and be made partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, 
look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase and, in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labour. They built supply cities, Pithom and Rameses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labour. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they were imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Puha, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. Here ends the reading. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. 
And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah, for the Gospel of the Lord. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. That's how the book Exodus starts. We are given the list of the names of Jacob's children and their households, and we're told there are about 70 people, and it forms the connecting point between Exodus and its narrative and Genesis and its narratives. So it's been a very, it's a very important statement. It's one of those ways in which in biblical texts you just sort of stitch together books so that you understand that there is a flow. So we're told that this is what happens. It's an interesting beginning to Exodus because we have a, we're told what's happened and we're told how everyone dies. Interestingly, um, Joseph is embalmed like an Egyptian high official, which of course what he is. So we've ended up with this sort of almost Egyptian stage. And as we go, we realise that something is different. And the something is different is, it's almost as though there's a silence of God. It's just a hint. Two of my uncles were priests, as well as my father. There was my uncle Vatham who lived in the south and my uncle Basil who was a priest in Calcutta. Remember staying with my uncle Basil who's my bro father's brother in Calcutta. He was a good old priest um, as all my ancestors have been and uncle Basil said this quote where our reading starts today. And a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He told me that. I was trained to be a priest, um, visiting with my father who was a priest, and there we were in Calcutta. He liked that quote because for him it represents what happens in organisations like the church when a new leader comes who doesn't know the past. And it was about the essentially transitory role that most of us have. We have this feeling that we were famous and important and then someone new comes in as boss and they don't have a history with us and we're forgotten. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. The last bits of um, Genesis have built Joseph up into this amazing character with the Pharaoh. Here Pharaoh is just called king of Egypt. And it's something perhaps that we're going to understand that Pharaoh is one of those evil kings rather than just a Pharaoh. A new king who did not know Joseph. And so starts one of the most amazing stories in human literature. This is a story where people who have been oppressed and who have been downtrodden have listened to the story of the Exodus and have found hope in a God who will bring liberation. Because this story starts with great pain. This new king decides that the Israelite people need to be sorted out. They are more numerous, says the king to his fellow Egyptians. We need to be very, very smart with them. Otherwise, they're going to dominate us. Or if we're attacked, they'll go on the other side. And so a process starts whereby the Hebrews, this is what the Egyptians call them, the Hebrews are now going to be oppressed. Terrible service. It's going to be very difficult. In the text, there's actually the words for swarming. And uh, the swarming is, um, is reminiscent of what's going to happen to um, to Pharaoh later, but it's also reminiscent of what's happened in the past. Here is a, a seething place, a teeming place. In the midst of all of this, God's creation just keeps going. And 
God's Israelite people, and it's in the beginning of Exodus that they start being called Israelites, and Israel is not so much the patriarch's name, but the people's name. And they're swarming, they're abundant. And no matter what Pharaoh does, they stay abundant. The Pharaoh represents that almost fascist authority that thinks that you can deal with problems by using power. So his shrewdness is a calculated political move to suppress people. And he wants to suppress them by working them so hard that they can't have uh, a children. Now, in the back of the story, we know that God is still going to do things. But at this point, it's quite secular in our modern terms. Uh, no matter what happens, uh, they keep breeding and they keep growing. How different to Genesis. The patriarchal stories are all so fragile. One child or two children or fighting among children. And it's the matriarchs who have difficulty having children. But here, these Israelites, these descendants, there are so many of them and they keep breeding. The Egyptians came to dead these Israelites. So they make their life bitter. Hard service in mortar and brick and every kind of field labour. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. There's a, a very powerful governmental pressure on them to be something. But it doesn't work. They're still being very, very uh, fecund. They still keep breeding. And so the king brings in the midwives. In any way of looking at this, the midwives must have either been uh, in charge of maternity hospitals or it's just story. Because there are two of them. Their names are Shifra and Pua. Uh, Shifra means beauty and Pua means splendour, something like that. And he says to them, uh, when the women um, are coming, these Hebrew women are having their children, and you see them on the birth stool, now the birth stool seems to have been two stones. Um, I'm not sure if they're kneeling, I think they're probably squatting on them, something like that. The two stones. When they give birth to a baby boy, kill the baby boy. But we're told the midwives feared God. Now, are the midwives Jewish or Israelite or are they Egyptian? Um, some thought one and some thought the other. Um, uh, and this has been through history. It actually adds an interesting dimension as to which they are. So if they are Jewish midwives, we see them as people who are very faithful to God. Their fear of God is something that upholds them. If they are Egyptians, what we see is something else going on. And, and so within Judaism, those who have wanted to uh, see them as, um, as, as Egyptians have recognised in Shifra and Pua uh, two people who are what would be called later righteous Gentiles. These are people who have an innate humanness. And this is what we're really thinking about. They have a, a, a human decency that says... How we behave is much more important than what the king says. And so they subvert the king. They will not murder the, the children, the boy children. And so the pharaoh calls them in and says, uh, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? And then they say, uh, because the Hebrew women, they are much more vigorous than Egyptian women. Um, and they give birth before we can get there. There's a sense in which the story of the midwives is a very private story. Maybe it's Pharaoh and the midwives. But Pharaoh is now really concerned. He's tried oppression. He's tried to uh, coerce the midwives into helping him. So he goes one step forward. He then commands all his people. Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. It is shocking. Yet, in the history of the last hundred years, we've seen this so many times. Um, 
We've seen it in the history, for example, after the Second World War in the East German secret police, the Stasi, who made sure that people um, dobbed in and kept records on their families and friends. With the fall of the Iron Curtain and the reunification of Germany, these Stasi records of who was informing on who have become something of a, of, 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 of a powder keg. Uh, it happened earlier where in Hitler's Germany, the Nazis would organize things very well so that people were spying on each other. So they could find out who was, um, who was dangerous. Um, Stalin's Russia or Soviet Union was the same. And you go back in history where there is a strong government that wants to control things, they will often use these sorts of forces uh, to try and do things and get their own way. Elizabethan England is full of it, the Elizabethan secret police that uh, was quite ruthless in finding and executing um, Roman Catholic clergy. It was associated with the fear that the French or particularly the Spanish would invade England England being a newly minted Protestant country, and yet there was ruthlessness. And across the, um, uh, 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 across from England in Europe, we have the Spanish Inquisition, or the Inquisition. Uh, again, another form of um, state power or religious power that is very much trying to um, to find people, to torture them, to kill them, to do all those sorts of things which are quite horrendous. And even today it happens um, in so many parts of the world, even in Australia, where uh, there's a secret trial been going on in the intelligence community in Canberra and a whole lot of information can't be said. And so nobody knows what the information or, or, or who's at fault or a whole lot of things are quite suppressed. So Pharaoh works in that way. So he's, he started with the midwives, trying to encourage them to do wrong, and now he gets the people involved and says, using what all demagogues do, he uses fear. These Hebrews, they are a danger to us. Let's kill them. Let's, f let's weed them out. Now you'll know, I said, that God seems quite absent from this. And there's a, a sense when, if we think of the, uh, the midwives being um, uh, e Egyptians, that they have got something of the wisdom of God going in them. And perhaps the notion of God in this part of Exodus is the notion that there is a, what we might call a natural religion, a sense of God, that can infuse any upright person. As we will go on, you'll see that Pharaoh, as a godlike character, someone who thinks he's a god, um, can in fact uh, assert authority. But here, good people will always find where God is. But the God we've been used to hearing about, even in the patriarchal narratives, seems strangely absent and silent. This is a God who doesn't seem to be hearing the cry of what is going on. And so chapter 2 starts with the birth and youth of Moses. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could no longer hide him, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen pitch. So we start one of the important concepts that is just there, for example, in the Hebrew. The papyrus basket, the word that is used for that is the word ark. The only other time, of course, is Noah's ark. And we're going to have a, a, a similar aquatic scene here. Um, so going backwards, this child will be put into a papyrus ark among the reeds. So the ark, going back to Noah's story and the water, but the reeds will push us forward into the story of the Exodus and the Sea of Reeds, the Red Sea. You know, no Moses taking the people across the sea, it's the Sea of Reeds. And so um, with, with exquisite linguistic art, the writers have stitched together the story of creation 
and what happens there, and the falling apart of creation with the Noah story, and the story of Exodus, the story of coming to the Sea of Reeds, which could be so dangerous to them. And just as the ark preserved Noah and his family in the waters, so in the reeds, um, Moses will cause the, the, the waters to part through the work of God and they will go through this sea safely. There's simple little things that connect the stories up and give us time then to enter imaginatively into the story. So Noah is put into this basket, this ark, and hidden in the reeds, and his sister, the first time we hear about his sister, later we'll know her as Miriam, his sister is watching from a distance to see what will happen. And along comes Pharaoh's daughter with her maids, and they go for a swim, and this child is screaming. And Pharaoh's daughter hears the child, brings, gets one, somebody to bring the child over and says, this must be one of the Hebrew children. And Pharaoh's daughter just takes him on. Miriam, standing by, says, oh, would you like a wet nurse for him from among the Hebrew women? And, Sarah's daughter, and Pharaoh's daughter says, oh, yes, please. And so Miriam takes her baby brother back to his mum who then looks after him until he is weaned and old enough to then go back to Pharaoh's daughter. It's one of the ex wonderful parts about this story is you have five women. You have Pharaoh as the man who is evil and using a very male sort of power to control and to be destructive. And we have five women who subvert it and I think we're meant to see the delicious irony of it. Uh, we have the two midwives. We have Miriam. We have Jochebed, the traditional name for Moses' mum. And then we have uh, Pharaoh's daughter. See, the themes of oppression and liberation start to come out yet again when we look at the women. See, the five women represent, in many ways, the powerlessness and voicelessness, the lack of voice of women. They, they can't say anything. They can't do anything. They're in a, a, a very powerful patriarchal society. And yet, with deftness and within constraints over which they have very little control, they then manipulate the system in order to subvert it and that's what they do. When we think of Exodus as being a document that speaks to liberation for Jews and Christians and much wider, often people who are oppressed have to find ways to subvert. I think the imagery of the two midwives is the best of it. From, a, from, from my religious perspective, only because they fear God. There is a, a higher power that, to whom they must owe allegiance. And so these women won't do what the power wants. And so they subvert the power and they say no. But each one of these five will subvert in some way. And we have this, this lovely irony that the Pharaoh who has sought everything to get rid of these Hebrew boys has a Hebrew boy brought into his court through his own daughter. And so we see a, a, an interplay of various events that will, in fact, further God's plans. We still haven't talked about God in the story, except for the Hebrew women, uh, midwives, but here we can see that something else is going on that will be very powerful. How do we deal with this sort of stuff in our lives is the question we have. You know, we've got a story that in many ways, and, in, and it's a subtle story that's full of potential for imagination as well as just for um, reading the text to, um, to infuse our minds. But here we have a story that actually 
invites us to start to understand a number of things. One of the things I've been stressing all the way through my talk has been the fear of God. Fear of God, as I've said, is about having an ultimate standard. And so this is one of the things we can ask ourselves. What is our ultimate standard? And as we've looked at it, we've also seen how powerless people who are voiceless can also subvert authority systems. And that uh, invites us to ask the question, how do we do things? See, what is our sense of agency? For example, um, in our present world, we, we can seem very small and insignificant. We can seem as though there is nothing we can do to change anything. Yet these five women suggest that there are things we can do to change things. So in your life, what, where are the spaces, where is the, I suppose you'd call it the wiggle room, where you can actually do something? We saw it in the Joseph story, and now we see it in the Moses story. And we see it with five particularly powerless people, women. What can you do? And behind all this story, I suppose the, um, the, uh, the successful procreation of the Israelites reminds us that even when God seems completely absent, God is still present. Pharaoh is trying to stop things happening, but even before Pharaoh comes, God is doing things. So perhaps for you and for me, sometimes when we feel most alienated from God, almost distant from God, the reality might be that God is actually still at work. In fact, I don't think it might be. I think the reality is that God is still at work. God, by being God, is by definition always active and present. God is infinite and eternal. God is creating. And so when you and I feel most distant from God or there is a silence of God, we need to be people who... Perhaps read a narrative like this and remember to believe that God is active. So even as they almost swarm like animals, it's, it's, it's about the, the absolute fecundity of creation, God is still there. And as we go through the Moses story, we will see how years later, after the birth of Moses, we will see how God then speaks and God's own name is revealed and God's presence becomes so real in this man Moses. As we go through this, I hope you and I will come to know Moses better and come to understand God's purpose for us better.
Let us pray. Lord of all mercy, we, your faithful people, have celebrated that one true sacrifice which takes away our sins and brings pardon and peace. By our communion, keep us firm on the foundation of the gospel and preserve us from all sin through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.